Okay, so welcome to lesson 12, where we look at the human eye. And as I stated earlier, this is the final lesson in our optics unit. We'll be moving on to biology starting next week or so after you finish your review, or sorry, your reflection for this unit, uh, of which it is posted on Classroom. And if you have any questions, you can ask in the document or you can post them on Classroom, make a comment, what have you. But at the end of the day, we will be done with this unit's lessons after today. Uh, so we're going to look at how the eye works and specifically some aspects of biology that connect nicely into what we've learned with our optics unit. So when we think of the human eye, we have to remember that all living things are made of cells as well as the products that those cells produce. And not all cells are the same. Bone cells are different from muscle cells due to their structure and their arrangement as well as what they, uh, how they function. And so when we start to think about the different types of cells and all the different types of functions, we can start to look at the specialization of each of those cells. And one of the most incredible specialized cell systems or cell structures or organs is the human eye. So when we think about light as a whole, and when we think about how light works with regards to reflections and mirrors and, and lenses, we can start to really appreciate and understand the, the intricacies and the beauty of the human eye because of the, the nature of how it perceives light and sends that information on into the brain for us to think about and perceive. So a couple of aspects just with regards to anatomy, when we look at the uh, human eye, the lens, retina, optic nerve, iris, cornea, pupil, all of those are important structures with which uh, information, specifically light information, is taken in and translated and transferred via the optic nerve to the brain. And so I'm going to go in a little bit of detail about these parts, but ultimately what we need to understand here is that when we think of the human eye, we have to understand that it is a converging lens. And it's a converging lens because if it wasn't and, and the light beams didn't meet somewhere, then it wouldn't be able to be collected information-wise by the parts of the eye that are responsible for collecting that light information and sending it to the human brain. So we have to recall the difference between converging and diverging. We really want to converge all that information to one point, and we want to make sure that it's focused on that one point, so that way the information can be taken in, digested, and translated, so to speak, by the brain. So. There's a couple of pieces of information with regards to the, the anatomy of the eye that I kind of want to get into. Uh, how light enters the eye, specifically through the cornea, lens, iris, and pupil. And how, if you take a look at your eye in high light or in, in low light versus a large amount of light circumstances, you'll start to notice that there are muscles that kind of change the shape that allow for the eye to react to its circumstances and its environment. So when we look at the cornea, it's made out of something called collagen fiber, which is very strong and flexible. And it is made of uh, nearby cells for the most part. And its main goal is to refract light to focus the image on the retina. So that cornea is going to be responsible for refraction of light. The lens, as we've learned in this class and in this lesson in this unit, it's a converging lens, which is also made of collagen, and its main goal is to refract uh, and focus the image right on the retina. So there's two components of refraction that go on, one through the cornea and then one through the lens. The lens is really the one that's gonna try to get that image focused on the retina. The iris is the colored part of your eye, and it opens and closes to allow more or less light to enter. The, the human eye it can only take in so much light information. If you've ever accidentally looked at a bright light or don't do this at all, today would be a good day to make that mistake. Looking at or directly close to the sun, your, your eye gets something called bleached rhodopsin for lack of it. It's, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but it takes on too much light and the cells responsible for, for taking that information, they get overwhelmed. And to prevent that overwhelmness, so to speak, uh, the iris is responsible for opening and closing to allow more or less light. It is a muscle, for lack of a better word, and as it widens and narrows, it will control the amount of light that comes in. And then lastly, the pupil is the hole in the middle of the iris that allows light to enter the eye. So how does the image get interpreted by the eye? Well, it, in the diagram above, it seems a little bit weird that the image on the retina is upside down. 
it forms a real image, right? It forms a real image, but it is inverted. So our brains kind of need to take that information in its upside down form and then reflip it. So this always kind of trips people out a little bit to think about it, but ultimately the image that our lens takes in and transfers into our brain is upside down. The brain then reflips everything to right side up. So we are able to orient ourselves. So the next time you think about it, the light that goes directly to your brain, everything is flipped upside down and it's our brain that transfers that information into to sense, making sense. Um, so the two components of that information receiving and translation and transformation, if you will, is the retina and the optic nerve. The retina is an area of light sensitive cells at the back of the eye. And, and it's what I was talking about with regards to if you look at too bright of a light, they get overwhelmed. Uh, and they're made up of two cell types called rods and cones. Rods are responsible for vision difference in brightness. Cones are uh, responsible for information with regards to color. So when you think about color blindness and when you take biology next year, you'll know that genetic deformations with regards to cones of people can lead to certain types of color blindness. So that's a cool little fun tidbit for next year's biology class, those of you who take it. The optic nerve is responsible for connecting those nerves and the, the, the cells within the retina to the neurons or the brain specifically. So it's gonna relay that information that the retina collects from the retina to the brain. And so just taking a closer look at how the rods and cones specifically work, cone cells are sensitive to that primary colors of light, the green, red, and blue. Whereas, <clears throat> pardon me, whereas those um, rod cells are just for that, that brightness and intensity. So the white and Roy G. Biv, that brain interprets those different wavelengths as colors as a result of how stimulated or understimulated the cone cells are. And because of there's so many of those cone cells and there are so many that are responsible for different wavelengths, it can take in that information, share that with the brain and then the brain interprets, oh, that is green, that is red, that is orange, that is purple, that's yellow, et cetera. And that's why a lot of people, because, and that's why I always have this interesting conversation with students when we talk about this specific concept. Um, different people have different quantities and clusters of certain types of cone cells in their eyes. So something that looks, for example, dark black to one person might look a little purple or it might look a little blue or some people it might even look a little bit red based on the structure and how um, many cone cells and how clustered they are. So, and that all depends on heritability traits that you inherited from your parents. And so something that looks dark black to myself might look purple to someone else or blue or a deep, deep, deep red. And so it's always an interesting conversation to have with students with regards to that subjectivity of it all in the sense that colors that are actually perceived by the human brain, um, there's a little bit of room for interpretation. So it's, it's a neat little uh, talking point with regards to the structure of the human eye. And, and it's a little something for you to, uh, to chat with about your parents and just say how old, you know, that's, that looks black to me, but maybe it's not actually. Um, so with regards to the eye, there are some issues that can arise. And, and those of you that have glasses or um, some type of corrective lens like myself, depending on how the lens is shaped or how the lens becomes misshapen, some issues with focusing can happen. And, and there are a couple that we'll talk about here. Uh, in the first example, we talk about hyperopia or farsightedness. This person can see far things well, but has difficulty with nearby objects. And that's when you look at that normal vision for objects on the left side of this diagram versus blurry vision as a result of closer objects for someone who's farsightedness, it has to do with the way that the lens refracts the light onto the retina. And if it's uh, the image location is too far behind the retina, closer objects will have difficulty being focused on by the eye. And so the solution is, as alluded to earlier, is a corrective lens of some sort, glasses, contacts, surgery, what have you. And the glasses or the lens or the contact, it basically moves that lens further out because you're having glasses on your face or on your eye. And as a result of that lens that's added in, it then refracts the light a little bit more and as a result of that, it pulls the image a little bit closer 
to the, to the retina. And as it pulls it closer and closer, it brings it into focus. And as a result of that change in refraction, that image is then now directly on your retina for your brain to process and, and take in that information. So it's quite cool that as you change the refraction uh, or that index of refraction of that lens, that the more stronger a lens refracts light, the more closer it will pull that image to the retina, depending on how bad your farsightedness is. And, and that's why people with different vision needs, uh, you can change the lens index of refraction to meet those needs for different people. So someone with really, really bad eyesight when it comes to farsightedness would need a stronger refractive lens, whereas someone with not that bad of farsightedness would only need a, a smaller number. So this explains um, why a converging lens makes sense to treat farsightedness because we want to change the path of the light rays to ensure those rays converge on the retina to form an image. With regards to myopia or nearsightedness, which is the predominant uh, majority of people who do have corrective lens, they are myopic or myopic and they have nearsightedness. This is where nearby objects create a clear image, but distance ob distant objects are blurry. And if you take a look at the diagrams again here at the top, the initial object, or sorry, the initial lens structure for someone with a normal retina, it produces an image that's directly on the retina. And as a result of that lens not having any misshapen issues or what have you, that image is gonna be crystal clear for faraway objects. For someone who is myopic or does have nearsightedness, the image forms before reaching the retina. And so we want to create what's called a divergent corrective lens to help correct the issue. Because if the image is forming before the retina, we wanna move that Im image back. So we wanna move the light rays away from each other just before they hit that lens. And then the lens can then refocus within the eye that image onto the retinas. And this causes light rays to diverge before entering the eye. And as a result of that, creating a more crystal clear image. So the key component here with regards to diverging lenses is that it causes light rays to move away from each other before entering the eye. And then the image can then form on the retina by the lens's natural ability. So there's one last final, uh, I don't want to call it a defect, but issue that can arise with regards to lenses in the eye. And it's uh, presbyopia, which is a form of farsightedness where they can see far things, but not close things. And it's caused by age. And it's as a result of the eye muscles getting weaker over time, just due to natural aging. Uh, so those of you with grandparents or older parents that need to wear reading glasses, for example, like my dad needs to wear, it's because the muscles that are responsible for opening and closing um, the iris, they get weaker over time. And, and to kind of help counter that, they get reading glasses. It's a form of farsightedness, but not that bad. Okay, that's it for the lesson today, folks. Again, if you do have questions about the final assessment over the next couple of days, please ask them. Otherwise, you can uh, continue as you are. Okay, bye.